Okay. Um, so just as a kind of recap for the trajectory of our nav night times this semester, we're trying to hit three main topics and they were chosen with intentionality. And the reason why we're doing one topic basically per month and then finding some different and unique ways to try to get that into your life is because um, I, at least one reason, uh, there's others, but at least one reason is I think that it has to do with our understanding of what it means to follow and be discipled to Jesus. And um, there's a lot more I can say, and I do say a little bit more in some of the episodes for the podcast, because that's really specifically where that is geared towards. But for this conversation, I think it's just important for you to hear that to follow Jesus and to be discipled towards him, I think we can filter that through a lens of um, simply learning and experiencing more, but not uh, undergoing a transformative um, work inside of our life, inside of our souls and our character by the power of the spirit. And so we actually begin to maybe accrue some knowledge and even occurring practices or dispositions towards the world or towards our faith, uh, but uh, not actually cultivating this deep intimacy with God and a transformed character uh, that reflects the newness of Christ's kingdom come into the world and uh, brought to bear in our lives. And so each of these <clears throat> topics that we're hitting this semester, we think are, are primarily some things that, that could create barriers or could uh, lead us away from this process of being discipled, of following Jesus into the newness of his kingdom. <clears throat> but uh, I'll, we'll get into tonight, and I hope a few things will become clear now if they haven't already in some of these talks we've given. So <clears throat> there's a few things I wanted to front end load this with, and I'm going to move some things out of the way here so I can see everybody. Uh, so on this, <laughs> on this slide, uh, I want you to notice there's this little um, caution sign up in the corner. And I've put that intentionally on a few of the slides because um, there are uh, some statements and just topics that I'm going to try to touch on that I want to present some caveats with. So the first one is that the goal of this time right now, the goal of this talk is not to label your story with mental or emotional health or unhealth but it's to hopefully offer a perspective of reality that anyone could benefit from. And um, again, there are, there are more things that could be fleshed out with a lot of these. And I've tried to indicate that by putting this little caution sign on the, on the slides that I'm presenting to let you know that if there's something with those that you're like, but what about this? Or that's not my experience. I'm trying to indicate at least to you on the front end, I think I understand that um, to some degree, but the other reality, the other couple of realities I want you to be aware of is I'm not a counselor. I'm not a trained professional counselor. I've been doing ministry for over a decade. Um, I'm pursuing seminary and being trained and just pragmatically, practically, and then living in my, my own life with Jesus. I feel like there are things that I have learned that can be helpful and I can offer, but I'm not approaching this from the standpoint of being a clinician in this area. And so I do want to recognize my own limits in being able to speak to some of these areas. I am human, however, and so there are experiences that I've had that I hope are similar can overlap with yours. And I think there are truths about reality that I've experienced and lived that I do assume and trust that are your experiences as well. And on that ground, I think we can both meet and have a conversation that hopefully can be really beneficial. And so with some of those caveats uh, to begin with, um, I, again, I'm, I'm hoping what I can do is offer a way forward for any of you here on this call or that end up potentially seeing this later on, <clears throat> and that it might lead you into a deeper communion with Jesus. And um, the, the, it may even lead you into the office of a trained counselor or therapist or um, create a pathway for vulnerability among some of the community that you're already engaged with and already a part of. And so uh, whatever end this brings you to, I, I, I'm just seeing this conversation right now as a kind of a link in, in that chain of conversation. So 
Um, I'm going to start a timer for myself because otherwise this will potentially go very long. So <clears throat> I want to read this quote uh, after I minimize myself. I'm a little too big. Uh, Rich Willodas in a book called The Deeply Formed Life says this. He says, to follow Jesus in this world requires us to embrace a fully human life alive to the dimensions of our interior worlds that often are repressed, ignored, and explained away with Bible verses and in the name of respectability. A rebellion is indeed needed, a rebellion marked by truth, integrity, and wholeness. <clears throat> so I want us to consider this rebellion and especially this idea of wholeness here. And to do that, I want us to think about Genesis 1. That's kind of where everybody starts. And if you think back to this, you don't have to turn there, but most people can uh, recite at least the first five words of the Bible in Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created. And I would offer to you that the way that you would summarize God's creation in the next two chapters is going to tell you a lot about your current, um, uh, obviously, view of God of creation, but also yourself, probably more than you would realize, maybe even tying into things from your family history or background, or just some of the ways that you view reality, because that there is a, a helpful question to characterize this. If you were to ask yourself, what is the defining characteristic of God's creation? Uh, you may have heard varying words from different pastors or teachers, even reading the Bible yourself. There may be some that are standing out to you right now. <clears throat> but it's important for us to make a distinction between what God says about his creation and oftentimes how we can label or talk about it. The defining characteristic of God's creation is that it is good. He says that over and over. And this is um, the, the Hebrew word tov. And it has, it means good. Certainly it means good. Um, and it is a robust word that includes the idea of perfection, uh, but also wholeness and uh, beauty and harmony there too. And so when God says that his creation is good, it is not just a statement of moral perfection. It, it is that, but it is uh, very much more than that. And we are doing ourselves a disservice to our relationship with God and even a view of our own humanity if we let it be limited to that. So I would offer you to you that this helps us to understand that God is not a perfectionist because what he doesn't say about his creation is that it is perfect. He says that it is tov. And to um, understand God as perfectionist, I think, is to limit our understanding of what he is. If we're anything, we could say that God is a holist, <laughs> not a perfectionist, that he creates things that are whole. So for us to now understand our current reality, with that in mind, we understand that where we live right now is an experience of broken wholeness. Things once were whole, not just morally perfect, but they were whole and in harmony and in a great beauty with one another as God's created order, and they have since become broken. And so humanity's rebellion in Genesis 3 is can be discussed in a lot of different ways and it's definitely multifaceted layers of sin and hurt and rebellion and evil even at work and you see that yes there was a moral imperative that uh god gave to adam and eve that was broken and there was also a mutual trust and support relationship between adam and eve as humans that was also broken there was injustice now that's present in the garden there was hiddenness there's a notion of the other there's compartmentalization, and that list will continue to go on as you look at Genesis 3. And it's obviously affected humanity in many different ways. But the essence, right, of our humanity that has been fractured in the garden, when we look at Genesis 3, it's created experiences, human experiences now, of shame and panic, anger, frustration, blame, emotional pain and, and disconnection. So God ushering Adam and Eve out of Eden, I think displays that humanity now lives in a world that is internally and externally uh, where we were not intended to inhabit. That internally even for Adam and Eve, 
they were experiencing humanity that was not whole, a humanity that they were not intended to experience, and then externally demonstrated by moving them out of the garden. Okay, so caution here. That was a really pithy statement. And I recognize that there is a danger in starting at Genesis 1 and 3 and using that to categorize all emotional and mental health uh, issues, diagnoses, and experiences. And that's not necessarily what I'm intending to do. I'm not suggesting that there are simple reasons. Uh, we are who and where we are as humans nor am I suggesting that there are simple solutions. That would be very foolish and uh, unloving, I think, of me to suggest that. What I do want us to grasp is that there is a reality that we all experience that is tied essentially to the beginning narrative of Genesis. And it is not the wholeness of the garden. What we experience now is not the wholeness, the tov that was experienced in the garden the goodness of God's creation. And that is something that we need to tie into and recognize. And it's also not what we experience now is also not the wholeness of the kingdom of God, which is and is coming into the world brought and inaugurated through Jesus Christ. I think of uh, Jesus's words in John 4, when he's talking to the woman at the well and he says, everyone who drinks of this water, what he's offering to her will be or with, at the well is will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And if, if we can appreciate what Jesus is offering to this woman who is certainly broken who is certainly outcast and marginalized in the society, who I would not doubt struggles with a sense of shame at least, if not other emotional health issues. I think that there is a life that Jesus invites us as well as this woman to, which opens a river of refreshment, of renewal and wholeness as we pass through a broken world. And I think that is a truth that we need to be willing to take at face value, that Jesus, as he's offering to this woman, is offering to us a river of refreshment for our inner life, even. Not just externally in the brokenness of the world around us and the sin and corruption of systems and actions and things, but even for our own life and our own emotional interconnectedness as human beings, complex as we are, made in the image of a complex God. So if we let this be what it is, what Jesus says that it is, I think that there is hope. And again, a picture of reality for everybody here that's listening to this. So um, <clears throat> I, would, uh, I would like you to um, maybe pause just for yourself for 20 seconds. It's definitely not long enough for you to really think about these questions, but for the time that we have, pause for a second and consider these two questions. Uh, for you and where you sit right now, what does it mean to be emotionally healthy in this life? And what does it take to experience that? Those are meaningful questions for us to consider, because if we don't know what we're aiming for or even how to get there, then we're going to have a, a lot of trouble, one, communicating about this idea, let alone actually experience any anything like this and moving along a path towards wholeness and healing. So I'll give you just a few seconds here to kind of uh, consider those ideas and move into them for yourself. This is a big group, but I am wondering if there's anybody that would be bold enough to maybe share a thought or two about either what you would define or what you think it means to be emotionally healthy in this life, broken as it is, and what it might take to uh, experience that in this life. You could choose one or both in your answer. Zach raised hand. So when I think of this question and I think about like what you said from John 4, 13 through 14, which is one of my favorite uh, chapters in John, I think two things. One, um, just being, finding joy in 
scripture and what Jesus says about us and what he wants for us. Um, another verse that came to me is like finding when Jesus in Matthew says like, come to me who are heavy burden for I give you, gent- I'm, for I'm gentle and lowly. And I, like he wants to take on our burdens and that. And I think for me, it's just like finding joy in scripture and finding joy in who Christ is and what it takes to experience that I think is uh, um, daily discipline within the idea that um, and also reminding ourselves that what we experience here is far different from what we will experience when we're with Christ and fully. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Zach. Uh, Sarah. Yeah, I'll add to that, um, that I think it takes work. I want to point that out. Like, I think it takes work to experience emotional health, no matter how you define it. Um, like I know for me personally, that has meant, I literally have scheduling. I have scheduled processing time for my emotions into my schedule. Cause I know myself well enough to know I straight up won't do it if I don't have it put in my life. Um, so I just want to add that, that like, I think we all recognize that this isn't easy, but I'm going to straight up say it. Like it takes work to do this. Yeah, that's fair. I'm going to move us ahead. Uh, questions that are, I think are helpful for you to keep considering, though, on this journey. <clears throat> I think um, for the for the purposes of the rest of our time, as I already said, what I'm going to intend to do is to try to uh, help us have a common picture of reality. And I think that wherever you are, um, whether you are uh, are in a place of life right now where you have a diagnosed mental or emotional uh, health issue or whether you know, the coming project for your uh, chem class is just really stressing you out, there, there is a, a reality that we can all anchor ourselves in and I think need to anchor ourselves in if, if we can experience some sense of wholeness uh, or semblance of health in these areas of our life with Jesus. But as, as it's been said, um, which we'll get to, it takes work in all of these areas, I think. It isn't, um, it isn't going to be fixed by pithy statements from a guy on a Zoom call, I'll tell you that much. Okay, so what is, what is the reality? <clears throat> and I think a, a main premise of this question is to recognize uh, in, in scripture that there is a, there is a direct link between <clears throat> maturity and health and growth and uh, believing and knowing what is true. And uh, we will get to this reality later on, um, but I think that the notion of believing what is true rather than believing things that are lies are, at, uh, are central to our idea of being able to mature and grow um, as people, as followers of Jesus. So I'm gonna offer uh, these three areas that I think there needs to be cultivated awareness and it takes effort in each of these areas, but I would uh, offer these three areas to you as, as places of your life to think, um, am I believing what is true? And do I have established patterns to help me uncover what is true if I don't currently understand that? So self-awareness, spiritual awareness, and scripture awareness are the three areas I'd like us to, to briefly talk about here. And I'll cover them each kind of in, in turn here. So self-awareness. And uh, <clears throat> this is, um, as, as we've said from Genesis, our, our lives experience a, a nature of being fractured, broken is a lot of times the language that's used with that. And I think that, that makes a lot of sense. There's a, a, a theologian, Ronald Rollheiser, who says that the air we breathe today is generally not conducive to interiority and depth, that, which is why we started with technology this semester, because technology has the potential to suck all of your time and attention away so that you never actually take the time or feel like you have the time to probe for depth and interior examination in your own life. And so if, if you uh, can't get your handle on technology, your time and affections under control, then this is going to be even harder to have an awareness and experience health in for you. <clears throat> There's a book by uh, Pete Scazzaro named, uh, called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality that if you haven't read, you should. 
uh, it's really wonderful. Um, but he uses this analogy of an iceberg when he's talking about um, the, the notion that there's a lot of, there's visible parts of our life, our behaviors, our speech, different parts of who we are, and even things that we understand about ourselves, but so much of who we are and the things that kind of govern our patterns and actions and lives lie below the surface. And it takes time and intentionality to be able to, uh, to uncover and come to an understanding of those things. And so to pursue self-awareness is essentially to understand the wholeness of who we are, not just the things that are easily accessible and visible towards us. So um, um, uh, he says in his book, uh, I found this helpful. He says, to feel is to be human. To minimize or deny what we feel is a distortion of what it means to be image bearers of God. To the degree that we are unable to express our emotions, we remain impaired in our ability to love God, others, and ourselves well. Why? Because our feelings are a component of what it means to be made in the image of God. To cut them out of our spirituality is to slice off an essential part of our humanity. And I, I hope that in, in hearing or reading this, that you feel a permission to name what you feel and to be able to move into that. And there is a, um, uh, well, I think the danger of this area of uh, experiencing self-awareness, oh, I didn't put this on there. I was going to a slide that I that doesn't actually exist. <clears throat> to experience this in our relationship with Christ is, um, I, I think there's a danger of, of um, believing everything that we've heard from even Christian, Christian institutions and well-meaning Christians seeking to disciple us because uh, there can be the expectation that self-awareness um, might come overnight. And uh, there are verses that you could use to uh, justify that. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, right? If, uh, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come, right? And now you are self-aware and uh, all the bad emotions that you once have are now gone. And if you're feeling any of those, you just need to shove them away because that's not part of your new nature. And, and that definitely, there, there is... Uh, a, a beautiful newness to the life that we have in Christ, a door that has been opened up, a passageway to the kingdom of God that was uh, closed and, and would have been met with wrath uh, apart from Christ. So it is not to minimize the newness of that creation, but it is hopefully to bring an understanding of the reality of how that works itself out in our life. It isn't magically poured into our lives uh, based on a, the a wrong theology of that verse, that to feel and to experience all of these wide ranges of emotions is part of our humanity and an invitation to explore them with Christ and bring them to him, I think is a great invitation that takes the grace of the cross and applies it to our life. So if you feel like this is a, a challenging thing for you, I, I feel like I, for a long time, still today, but for a long time, I've had a very hard time um, naming or you might say accessing my emotions or feelings and, and uh, stating preferences or knowing when I was actually angry or frustrated or upset, things just felt off. And, um, and I can see this with my kids a lot of the time too, as they're growing and developing, they just, they react in great bouts of frustration or anger. And oftentimes I think it's because they are confused at really what they are feeling. And so uh, there's two practices that I've been offered to you, and you could stick, take like a screenshot of this. This, um, all of this will be on on YouTube uh, tomorrow too, and I can put slides and these practices up on our website as well. But uh, there's two practices, and this first one I think is uh, is to help you maybe examine your feelings, to pause and kind of sit with these questions and let yourself answer honestly. Um, and remembering the grace of the cross helps you to do that uh, because you can sit honestly at the cross um, with Jesus, recognizing that all of these things, he is, uh, he is walking with you through them. <clears throat> so asking these questions, what are you mad about? What are you feeling sad about? What are you anxious about? And what are you glad about? Um, these are practices from <clears throat> um, Rich Volodas, who I mentioned earlier in his book, The Deeply Formed Life, offers these two practices there. Um, 
And I think this is this can be really helpful to spend time, but it takes some intentionality. Um, if you don't give yourself the time to do this, it probably won't happen. The second practice would be to examine your reactions to things. Um, probably if I asked, were there any times this last week where something happened and you would say that your reaction towards it was disproportional to maybe what was merited or what, what somebody else would have expected from you knowing you or just from kind of the normal person. And my guess is that we've all had at least one thing that has, has elicited some kind of disproportional reaction from us, whether it's um, fear that doesn't actually seem based in reality or worry that keeps us up all night or um, anger that, came, that comes out uh, much more aggressively than what we would want towards something. And to be able to pause and examine those reactions can help us have better self-awareness of what the real reality and condition of our interior lives looks like. And so asking these questions about things that happen, what, you know, what happened? Um, what, just what was the circumstance? What am I feeling as a result of that? What's the story I'm telling myself? Why, what motivated, what kind of, what was the repeating thing that drove me into the reaction that came out of me? And then to meet that with the gospel, what did, what would Jesus say to me if he was standing right here? What does scripture say about the way I reacted about the about the situation itself. And uh, this one I found really helpful, this last question, what counter instinctual action is needed? For me, uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, there was a conflict that I experienced with Christy because I had dropped the ball like totally on Valentine's Day. And in my uh, normal reactive pattern, when I feel uh, frustrated at myself and I feel guilty, I run. And I was like literally picking up the car keys because I felt ashamed and I felt sad. And I felt like I didn't want to confront both uh, the hurt that I had actually caused and the, the reality of what needed to be done to make it right. And so the counter instinctual action for me is put down the car keys and stay and talk and recognize the hurt that was caused and to take ownership of that and to move into that uh, with Christy to restore relationship and to, for myself, ask the Lord for help and patience uh, to see those areas of my life transformed. So this takes work. This doesn't happen overnight, but I do think it helps us have a way forward to know ourselves, to know your heart uh, better, to know your emotions better in these areas. Spiritual awareness. <clears throat> so I'm going to move fairly quickly through this. Uh, one, because it's full of land, landmines, honestly, in a lot of areas. There's a lot of statements that I was thinking about making that I'm uh, honestly pulling back the reins a little bit because um, this, uh, for not knowing where each of you are in the areas of mental and emotional health, um, I recognize that I, this is an area I think I could easily do more harm than good with some of the things that I say. But I, again, what's the reality that I think will help us? It's the, I think there's a few things. You are more than your body, okay? Uh, but there's a little caution sign up there. So you are more than your body, but you do have a body. And that includes uh, complex biochemical reactions that affect mental health. And, that in, and it is not to say that um, I'm trying to negate that. That is not at all what I'm saying. I think that's a very real part of that. I've had many family members that have experienced mental health issues that I think are attributed to uh, biochemistry issues in their brain. And, and yet, <clears throat> there is uh, a spiritual component to who we are as people. We have a soul, we have a spirit. And uh, so it's not to diminish the physical reality of our bodies. It is to include and bring into an understanding, you are, are more than your body. So, the second thing I would say on this area is that you have a real spiritual enemy that is out for blood, for, uh, for lack of maybe a, a better, more aggressive way to say it. And again, I, I want to draw attention to a caution here <clears throat> that, that there are multitude factors that I think are involved in the areas of mental and emotional health in our life. And this isn't to over-spiritualize. It is just to call out the reality of the spiritual uh, uh, world that exists portrayed in scripture. And if you read it, you're going to encounter things that make you think it's kind of weird and loony. And that uh, doesn't sit quite right with my Western uh, sentimentalities. But this is the picture 
of uh, that we get uh, even from Jesus's life. Uh, oh, I didn't put it up here. So I'm flipping again for a slide that's not here. Jesus in Luke 22, um, he says this to Peter, uh, also called Simon. Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I'm, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times that you know me. <clears throat> Jesus points to reality that, that Satan's desire is to sift this dude like wheat. Like what a visual of uh, Satan's influence in somebody's life, his desired influence in somebody's life. But Jesus said, well, I prayed for you. I've engaged in a spiritual discipline on your behalf because this isn't just a physical thing. I've prayed for you. And yet there's still consequences it seems that are happening because of some of these spiritual forces at work and even some things happening internally in Peter that are leading towards this denial there's a whole bunch there right but if nothing else Jesus is clearly pointing out that there is a real spiritual enemy that is out for blood in our lives we have to be aware of and take that reality seriously the last thing I would say is until I until you live connected to um, this reality that there's uh, two reality, uh, that you must realize your need for God's power over spiritual, spiritual forces. If you want to live connected to the way the world really works and the way that it actually functions and the forces that are really present in our lives and in the spiritual realm, you have to realize that you need God's power over these spiritual forces. And I think of Paul's words in his writings to the Ephesians, um, he says uh, at the beginning of uh, chapter, near the middle of chapter six, he says, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Paul just like cuts right into this. And he's trying to pull back the curtains of the way uh, the world and the universe operate, both in the physical and the spiritual realm. And says, you know, if you have conflict or if you're experiencing issues on this earth, you're not wrestling against the flesh and blood people that you're around. There are dark, evil, he says, spiritual cosmic powers that are at work there. And that is where the real issue in battle lies it is interesting he names off this armor of god and it would be easy to just um like allegorize or, or metaphorize all of that towards ourselves which there there may be a reality to those for sure but you can look up and find uh, old testament references for almost every piece of that armor always in connection to the armor that god himself puts on or that he puts on his coming anointed messianic servant jesus this is why he begins this by saying, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. That this armor is, a, is armor that has already been put on by the saving Messiah in his triumphal victory over Satan and sin and death. That is the power that I need, that I desire to live under, because these spiritual forces don't seem like anything I want to mess with. So again, this is a reality of our life. I'm not saying it's all encompassing in the areas of mental and emotional health, but I think to avoid it or to not consider it as part of that journey towards health or part of our experience in the world is to foolishly be unaware of the true reality of the world in which we live. So lastly, scripture awareness. <clears throat> I'm going to offer to you that scripture is not a prescription, but an embrace. <clears throat> to be aware of scripture in the area of emotional and mental health, it's not a prescription that solves it. Um, and the, I think the most dangerous passage in this area would be Philippians 4, uh, 4 through 7, this area, right? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice, right? Don't be anxious about anything. Just pray about it, but be thankful, but just pray about it and you'll be given peace. And uh, I'm not trying to minimize the sufficiency and the authority of that passage, but it has been, I think, severely misapplied in a lot of cases and has done probably harm. I wouldn't be surprised if some of you on this call have been harmed even by the ways that that verse has been talked about. And so scripture is not meant to be a prescription, 
but an embrace for our life. Because ultimately, as Jesus said, you come to the scriptures because you think that in them you find life, but it's these scriptures that point to me. If only you would come to me that you might find life. It's an embrace to come close to Christ and to come under his sheltering wings, as the psalmist would say. So I want you to consider something quickly. I'm going to go through this. I know we're stretching time here. <clears throat> uh, you can close your eyes. I want to walk you through a little visualization. If you, if you would uh, indulge me in this, okay, that um, um, you can close your eyes if you want. You have a, a great dream for your life. You've been thinking about about this thing for a long time. There's, there's peace uh, down the road. There's wholeness down the road. There's love and there's, there's bounty. And uh, you've sensed God uh, leading you towards something and you've stepped out in faith, trusting that God's uh, promises and um, counting on the faithfulness that he's already actually shown you and many other people uh, in your life along the way. And it's not always easy. And you, you know that that's kind of par for the course of life, but you persevere, you persevere nonetheless, knowing that God is, is with you. And then one day, though, you start to see your dream kind of begin to crumble. It, it doesn't just crash down all at once, but you start to see holes poking through. And the peace and the wholeness and the bounty that you were picturing down the road is, is now looking much farther off and, and much less likely. And finally, one day, it crashes. It breaks. And... You've played all of your cards and you've exhausted every option and you have even asked other people for help and exhausted every friendship and you're left alone and seemingly worse off than before you even began. Not only is your life a mess, but the God that you once trusted so willingly and unflinchingly seems distant and maybe cruel at best. And you were wondering, was this just a sick joke? And you're left waiting to figure out the path forward. And you don't even know what to do next, much less how to get through the next day. And maybe this describes some of your experience with mental health. Maybe this uh, is describing your experience with COVID. Maybe this is describing your experience in college at Miami or your family relationships or your friendships. It could be all of those things. Um, it's also essentially the journey of Israel in the Old Testament up to the exile. Their systems of, of worship, their community rhythms, the very notion of God's presence and protection and character was rocked to the core when Jerusalem was defeated and they were led out by the Babylonians into exile. And so what did they do? Psalms <laughs> is what happened. As a result of this, <clears throat> I have a friend uh, named Matt, and I was asking him what what he has done in his spiritual life when he has encountered uh, like dry seasons or seasons where he's felt like God is distant or it's just been challenging to seemingly connect into his relationship with God. And he says, you know, I've realized that uh, Scripture never promises that we won't experience uh, frustrations or dry seasons in our relationship with God. He says, but what I have found in scripture is a lot of companions in that journey uh, and in that experience. And so I would, <clears throat> I would uh, offer to you that as you become aware and go to scripture, especially I would encourage you to go to Psalms in this area, I think you will find uh, many companions on a journey experiencing a wide range of emotional and mental states of health. And I would direct you uh, maybe to begin in a couple places, Psalm 77. I was hoping we'd have some time to walk through this, but that is a pipe dream that is uh, quickly crumbling, so to speak. Um, but Psalm 77 uh, talks of, of one who is uh, crying, weeping aloud, unable to sleep, unable even uh, to a point to speak or pray anymore. And Simply their spirit is just pondering and asking very raw questions. Will the Lord reject forever? And will he never be favorable again? Has, he, has his favor ceased forever? Has his promise come to an end forever? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Or has he in anger withdrawn his compassion? These are raw questions. And I think there's a great companion in some parts of our life that we 
can come and find here in Psalm 77. The other place that I would direct you is Psalm 42, which again, the first verse may sound very familiar as the deer pants for the water brooks. So my soul pants for you, O God. And that's has like some warm fuzzy imagery maybe around it for you, but this is like drought, thirst kind of talk. It's like this deer is needing water or it's going to die. And our soul is needing, panting after God or I'm going to die kind of imagery. This is the state of the psalmist here. There's a rawness that we need to come to terms with and to, to grapple with here in the Psalms that I think will help our awareness of the paths on which scripture would want to actually lead us into health in these areas. So to jump through these, <clears throat> I would offer to you this thought um, in reference to the scriptures, um, also uh, given to me by my friend Matt, who'd say, don't doubt in the dark what is true in the light. And sometimes uh, choosing to not doubt is the best that we can do rather than having faith. And so um, I offer that to you. It's been something that's been strengthening to me and Christy in times of darkness for our life. Um, whether it was this last November when um, Elliot, our six-year-old, had a, a kidney injury that um, became very severe and was hospitalized and had to have surgery for, um, or um, any number of troubles where we've had to uh, trust in what seems like a very dark place, uh, and yet holding on to what we have believed to be true of God and of other people and our journey with Jesus uh, when we've experienced the light. So I think the scriptures not only help us to understand what is true about God and our world and our humanity, they help us to see the faith of many before us. And this faith is filled with feelings and emotion. And we can learn a lot about the practice of our faith now through the words that have been given through all the scripture. I think especially if we look into the Psalms here too. <clears throat> Instead of walking a lot through, um, I, I was gonna have us uh, explore what would happen if you take one of these away? What are you kind of left with? Um, that would be a question, the great processing question might even appear on, appear on the monthly reflection at the end of the month. Of what might happen if you take these three away. Or if you're really curious, I'm happy to talk more. But just remember, I'll reiterate this again. I'm not a counselor. I'm not here trying to prescribe or to label where you're at. What I am trying to do is to create a picture of reality that I think will help all of us on this journey. And I recognize this is just the beginning of this conversation. Um, we're going to be having a conversation for a podcast with some friends um, who have walked a lot of this journey themselves and can offer more of a personal experience with this. Um, even than I can. Um, and so I'm very grateful for the willingness to have this uh, honest conversation that I think will be really beneficial for you, maybe even some of your friends on this too. But what I am is I am a friend and um, I can come uh, as a friend to you or to others. And so I'm offering my email there too, or you can reach out to any of our other staff um, if you're in need of a friend to reach out. So uh, I'm, I'm going to pray quickly. Uh, thanks for hanging in. Uh, Lord Jesus, would you uh, grant grace on this journey through a broken world? Uh, would you refresh our souls and spirits? Um, would you help us to um, have awareness and a picture of um, the truth of uh, this reality in which we live that would lead us into um, uh, an experience of streams of, of living water in our life flowing from you, uh, that we could experience the true nature of uh, wholeness of Tove and your kingdom, um, that we would experience that there with you. Um, so would you lead us and bless this community in your name?